Good evening. It's Monday, April 4th. President Joe Biden calls for a war crimes trial against Russian President Vladimir Putin and says he'll seek more sanctions after reported atrocities in Ukraine. Biden declares Putin is a war criminal. We have to gather all the detail so this can be an actual have a war crime trial. This guy is brutal. Top leaders around the world respond to the gruesome evidence of civilian death and torture found after Russian troops retreat from areas around Kiev with resounding calls for justice. Hungary's far right-wing populist prime minister Viktor Orban declares victory in Sunday's national elections, claiming a sweeping mandate for a fourth term as Hungary's prime minister. Republican Senators Lisa Murkowski and Mitt Romney Romney announced they will vote to confirm Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's historic elevation to the U.S. Supreme Court, giving President Biden's nominee a burst of bipartisan support and all but assuring she'll become the first black female justice. Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Dick Durbin of Illinois celebrates the history in the making. It's the first time that the committee has had the opportunity to advance the nomination of a black woman to sit on the Supreme Court. This is an historic moment for the committee and for America. The temperatures on Earth will shoot past a key danger point unless greenhouse gas emissions fall faster than countries currently have committed. The world's top body of climate scientists warning of the consequences of inaction but also noting hopeful signs of progress. Senate bargainers reach agreement on a slimmed-down $10 billion package for countering COVID in the United States with treatments, vaccines, and other steps, drawing quick support from President Biden, who initially pushed for a $22 billion package. And Sacramento police arrest a man connected to the shooting that killed six people and wounded a dozen others in the heart of California's capital, in the nation's worst mass shooting so far this year. From Pacifica Radio, KBFA Berkeley, KBFK, Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. The United Nations Secretary General is calling for an independent investigation into reports and images of civilians killed in the Ukrainian city of Bucha, just outside the capital, Kiev. Ukrainian officials say they discovered dead civilians, some with their hands tied behind their backs and shot through the head, and hundreds of other bodies left scattered in areas formerly occupied by Russian troops. Russia has denied the reports and called the images staged. Human Rights Watch Conflict and Crisis Director Ida Sawyer told CNN that her group works to independently verify such killings. We have documented numerous cases of war crimes committed uh, during this, this conflict in Ukraine and, and we do you know, believe that those responsible should be held to account. So this is sending a mes message that there are consequences for for these actions committed by Russian forces in Ukraine. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, said in a statement that the reports raise questions of grave breaches of international humanitarian law and serious violations of international human rights law. President Biden today called for a war crimes trial against Russian President Vladimir Putin and also said he'd seek more sanctions after the reported atrocities in Ukraine. Biden's comments to reporters came after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited Busha, one of the towns surrounding Kiev, where Ukrainian officials say the bodies of civilians have been found. We have to gather all the detail so this can be an actual have a war crime trial. This guy is brutal. And what's happening in Busha is outrageous. And everyone's seen it. 
Ukraine's prosecutor general said the bodies of 410 civilians have been removed from the Kiev area towns that were recently retaken from Russian forces. Some had their hands bound behind their backs. Associated Press journalists saw the bodies of at least 21 people in various spots around Bucha, northwest of the capital. President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, was asked by a reporter if the atrocities had been carried out by rogue Russian soldiers or had been ordered from above. Is it your sense that, that the atrocities that we're seeing in Bucha are based on orders coming from Putin or his senior military officials, or, or is there a chance here that this is sort of Russian forces acting on their own, and is there even a distinction? I don't want to get into uh, the specific intelligence related to Bucha at this point, but what I will say, as I said at the outset, is that even before the invasion happened, uh, we shared information with the public, with the press, including from this podium, that Russia was intending, as a matter of policy, not as a matter of one guy in a unit in a suburb of Kyiv, but as a matter of policy in this war, to kill dissidents, to kill those who caused uh, problems for the occupation, uh, and to impose a reign of terror across occupied territories within Ukraine. That is what we are seeing play out. So no, we do not believe that this is just a random accident or the rogue act of a particular individual. We believe that this was part of the plan. We declared it uh, from this podium as part of the plan, and now we are seeing it play out in real life in living color in these terrible, tragic images we are seeing come from Bucha. Ukrainian po uh, President Zelensky called the Russian actions genocide. Biden and U.S. officials, however, stopped short of calling the actions genocide. National Security Advisor Sullivan said the U.S. has not yet seen a level of systematic deprivation of life of the Ukrainian people to rise to the level of genocide. But he said the investigation of war crimes was underway by several different means. The first is the information we and our allies and partners gather, including through intelligence sources. And we actually, within our intelligence community, had previously stood up a team to be able to document and analyze war crimes and work closely with the State Department in doing so. And we're also coordinating with key allies and partners who have their own capacities. The second is what the Ukrainians themselves will do on the ground to develop this case to document the forensics uh, of these tragic and senseless killings uh, in this particular instance and in other instances across Ukraine. The third is uh, international organizations, uh, including the United Nations, but others as well, uh, uh, prominent international non-governmental organizations with real credibility and expertise in this area. And then the fourth is all of you, because part of building this case is relying upon the global independent media who has images, interviews, documentation. And when you put all of those four sources together, you can build, we believe, a package that can stand up to the relentless disinformation we are likely to see and have already started seeing from Russia, and that ultimately the truth will withstand the assault on the truth that we can uh, expect to come from Moscow. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen tweeted today that the European Union will send investigators to Ukraine to help the local prosecutor general document war crimes. Meanwhile, a Russian law enforcement agency says it has launched its own investigation into the allegations that Ukrainian civilians were massacred in the suburbs of Kiev that were held by Russian troops, focusing on what it calls false information about Russian forces. Forces. The investigative committee claims Ukrainian authorities made the allegations with the aim of discrediting Russian troops and that those involved should be investigated over possible breaches of a new Russian law banning what the government deems to be false information about the war in Ukraine. The United States plans to seek a suspension of Russia from its seat on the U.N.'s Human Rights Council in the wake of rising signs that Russian forces may have committed war crimes. As according to U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, in a statement, Thomas-Greenfield made the call for Russia to be stripped of its seat on the Human Rights Council in the wake of the reports over the weekend about the violence against civilians in Busha. Sarah Walton reports. 
The United States says it will work with Ukraine and a number of other UN member states to request that Russia is removed from the Human Rights Council. It comes as Ukraine says it's investigating possible war crimes committed by Russian troops after around 50 bodies were found in the town of Bucha. A two-thirds majority of the UN General Assembly would be needed to approve Russia's removal. At least 140 of the 193 member states previously backed two resolutions condemning Russia's actions in Ukraine. I'm Sarah Walton in New York. Russia and the other four permanent members of the UN Security Council, Britain, China, France and the United States, all currently have seats on the 47-member Human Rights Council, which is based in Geneva. The United States just rejoined the council this year after... President Trump pulled the U.S. out of it. The European Union is considering strengthening sanctions on Russia in the wake of the reports that Russian forces may have committed atrocities. Rosie Burchard has more from Brussels. The EU has imposed four rounds of sanctions on Moscow in response to the invasion, but reports of war crimes emerging from the Ukrainian town of Bucha have prompted Brussels to start preparing stronger sanctions still. While EU leaders have expressed shock over the reports and vowed to hold perpetrators accountable, divisions persist within the bloc on the controversial topic of an energy embargo. Ukraine says some EU nations are effectively bankrolling Russia's war efforts through daily oil and gas purchases. Some EU countries, including Poland and Lithuania, are pushing for an embargo go. But others, such as Hungary, Germany and Belgium, have spoken out against the idea, warning that cutting Russian gas imports overnight would likely be more damaging to the EU than to Moscow. The Kremlin says allegations that Russian troops committed atrocities in Bucha are untrue. Rosie Burchard, Brussels. The French Foreign Ministry announced today that France has decided to expel numerous Russian diplomats, saying their activities were contrary to France's security interests. The announcement came hours after Germany said it was expelling 40 diplomats, and Lithuania said it had expelled the Russian ambassador and will recall its own envoy to Moscow. No number immediately given for how many are being expelled by France. The German news agency DPA quoted the German interior minister as saying that the diplomats being expelled from Germany are those whom we attribute to the Russian intelligence services. A senior U.S. military official says about two-thirds of the roughly 20 Russian battalion groups that have been located around Kiev have now left and are either in Belarus or on their way there. The U.S. has said that the vast majority of Russia's approximately 125 battalion groups had been in Ukraine overall during the early fighting. The official who spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss a military assessment said the U.S. assesses that Russian forces are being resupplied and reinforced in Belarus and would then go back into Ukraine, potentially in the Donbass region in the east. In addition, Russian troops have been moving out of Sumy and back into Russia, but they have been reinforcing and repositioning their artillery and putting more energy into the fight around the city of Izm, which lies on a key route to the Donbass. Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vereshuk says more than 1,550 civilians were evacuated today from the besieged port of Mariupol in the southeastern part of Ukraine. Vereshuk said a total of 2,405 people were evacuated along a humanitarian corridor route running from Mariupol to the Ukraine-held city of Zaporizhia, with 1,553 of those coming from Mariupol itself, the rest from other locations in the heavily contested area. She said the people used the dwindling number of private vehicles left in the area to get out of Mariupol, and that a convoy of seven buses sent to help remained unable to enter the city to collect people. Mariupol on the Sea of Azov is a key Russian military objective that has faced horrific bombardment. Very Chuk said uh, that 971 other people were evacuated from five locations in the eastern Luhansk region, where Russia is now focusing much of its military efforts.
The Ukrainian community inside the United States is stepping up its calls for the Biden administration to do more to help their beleaguered country of origin. Mary Sherman filed this report. Stand with Ukraine and pray for us. Help us. Close the sky over Ukraine. Please. Ukrainian Americans gathered outside the White House to call for more support for their homeland as Russian forces build strength in the eastern part of that country. Ukraine accused Russian forces of carrying out a massacre in the town of Bucha amid reports of civilians lying dead alongside roads and in mass graves. Russia's defense minister denied the allegations. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia's withdrawal from the north is slow and cautioned many dangers remain. The first one is that the bombing may continue. The second is that they are mining all this territory. Houses, equipment, even the bodies of people who were killed. There are a lot of tripwires, a lot of other dangers. A White House spokesman warns the invasion is far from over and promised continued military, economic and humanitarian support. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Sunday said the administration continues talks with European allies about tightening sanctions against Russia. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump argued at a weekend rally that President Biden's handling of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan opened the door for the conflict. This invasion of Ukraine would never have happened if I was in the White House, not even a chance. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. You're listening to the Evening News on KBFA Berkeley, KBFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. Russian President Vladimir Putin has congratulated the Moscow-friendly leaders of Hungary and Serbia on winning elections. In a letter sent today to Hungary's Nationalist Prime Minister Viktor Orban, whose right-wing Fidesz party won a landslide victory in Sunday's vote. According to the Kremlin, Putin said that despite the difficult international situation, the further development of bilateral partnerships Partnership fully conforms to the interests of the peoples of Russia and Hungary. But Putin also congratulated Serbian President Alexander Vucic for his re-election Sunday, saying that the outcome of the vote confirms a broad public support for his independent foreign policies. The Russian leader voiced hope that Vucic's activities will help further strengthen the strategic partnership between Russia and Serbia. John Pfeffer of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington told Brian Edwards Teekert the election results give Putin a little more maneuverability on the political playing field of Europe. There was speculation that any associations with Vladimir Putin in the past would be kind of political suicide uh, for candidates going into elections this year post-invasion. And in Hungary, uh, the opposition was uh, conservative. I mean, there was a kind of unified opposition around a pretty conservative, um, traditionally conservative political candidate. Uh, but even that was not enough to kind of unseat Viktor Orban. And, and even worse, uh, if you look at the election results, an even further right-wing uh, party, uh, anti-vaccine-oriented, uh, our homeland party, won seven seats in parliament. So it, it wasn't just a vote for Orban personally, but it was a, a, a kind of a, 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 a swing even further to the right for the Hungarian population. Um, and I think this will send uh, a message to other leaders throughout the kind of far right in Europe that they don't have to um, uh, disassociate themselves so so strongly from Putin. Um, and, you know, practically speaking, within the European Union, it means that this division between um, countries that are uh, uh, that have kind of authoritarian tendencies, uh, such as Hungary, uh, such as Poland, um, plus some other countries that are outside the European Union, like Serbia, where there also was an election, uh, will continue to kind of represent a an illiberal tendency. And this is exactly what Vladimir Putin has wanted to cultivate over the last decade or so. Um, not necessarily a, uh, a distinctly pro-Russian element, although there is some of that in Europe, but at least uh, a political 
a coalition of groups that are illiberal in the same ideological mold as Putin himself. For the purposes of advancing an ideology or for the purposes of kind of fracturing the unity of entities like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Well, I think that certainly Putin is interested in undermining NATO um, and he certainly had Donald Trump as an ally in that regard. But I think uh, the strategy is more specifically um, targeting the European Union. And the European Union is an institution which uh, Putin views as you know, antithetical to Russian designs. Antithetical in the sense that it, like NATO, has kind of moved in, uh, ever westward, ever eastward rather, um, and encroaching on the former Soviet space. Um, certainly a desire to become a member of the European Union was a major motivating factor for the Euromaidan protests in Ukraine. Uh, six or seven years ago, continued to be a kind of uh, beacon for um, anti, uh, anti-authoritarian movements throughout the former Soviet space. So the European Union as an institution is definitely uh, perceived by Putin as uh, a kind of um, a challenge to Russian authority. Uh, so that's that's primarily it. I mean, there's also kind of an ideological desire to see um, potential uh, friends in Europe that can, you know, lead to greater trade possibilities, for instance, uh, you know, uh, stronger relationships with Italy, for instance, um, stronger relationship with Marine Le Pen and the far right in France. Um, and all of these figures uh, in this kind of loose ideological coalition can assert uh, policies that were down to Russia's benefit, whether it's uh, undercutting support for uh, the accession of new members of the European Union, or even in the case of Ukraine several years ago, just a a new, uh, more beneficial trade relationship. So I think that's, you know, has been Putin's strategy. And it looked uh, like the invasion of Ukraine basically destroyed that strategy. Uh, but the election of, of Orban and of Vucic in Serbia most recently suggests that uh, as with Putin's popularity inside Russia itself, the invasion has not had the kind of negative impact that many uh, initially assumed. John Pfeffer is the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. U.S. religious communities are leading the charge to welcome refugees displaced by the war in Ukraine. In Southern California, pastors and lay individuals are stationing themselves at the Mexico border, waving Ukrainian flags and offering food, water, and prayer. Around the country, other groups are preparing to provide longer-term support on housing, work, health care, and schooling. The U.S. has agreed to accept up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees and resettlement agencies can use all the help they can get. Deep cuts during the Trump administration led them to slash staffing and programming. And they're already helping tens of thousands of refugees from Afghanistan following last year's Taliban takeover of the country. Ukrainians living in the San Joaquin Valley have watched in horror as the nation of their birth suffers the devastation of Russia's invasion. With broad community support, they came together over the past week to collect much-needed supplies to send to people in Ukraine. Vic Medoyan filed this report from Fresno. This is just the Ukrainians getting together for one cause, is helping Ukrainian people across the Atlantic. That's Mikhailo Sistok a Ukrainian by birth and a nurse at Fresno's Community Regional Medical Center by profession. Like the rest of the world, he's watched as the Russian invasion has laid waste to that sovereign nation. He's one of about a thousand Ukrainians living in the region. Sistok says the majority know each other or each other's names and attend church with one another in Fresno. They're now observing in anguish and wonder about loved ones back home. 
majority of us have relatives uh, as close as grandparents on my side on my wife's side we have uh, her sister with her husband and children uh, so it's it's very near and dear to us and every day that we call them and able to hear their voices and know how they are doing is reassuring and helping us and at the same time the longer the situation drags and the situation develops the more broken they get and the more difficult it is for us to watch the situation as cities get destroyed infrastructure and people when the war started local ukrainians held prayer vigils that congealed widespread support wanting to help more directly the ukrainian community came together and organized a six-day drive to collect essential items like food clothing and hygiene products the city, along with churches and nonprofits, helped to gather more than 160 boxes of packed supplies that will fill a container that's on its way to Europe. Sistock says getting in touch with family and friends by telephone and internet is still viable in the western half of Ukraine, but difficult in the east because there's no electricity, phone lines are down, and much of the infrastructure has been devastated by the incessant bombing. Some of the people volunteering in Fresno today have not heard from their families for weeks. He can think of a multitude of reasons why Russia has invaded this country, but like everyone, Sistok wonders how far Putin is willing to go to achieve his conquest. I think what the driving force behind the Ukrainians taking arms and being so fierce in their fighting and being so successful in resisting is the fact that they know what freedom they're fighting it for. They have lived for 30 years outside of communist regime. They have lived in a free Ukraine like me. I was born in a free Ukraine. We don't know nothing about communist, socialist type of environment where one person or one government controls and distributes everything. And we want a free market. We want to be able to choose who we do business with. We want to be able to choose uh, what, what, what do we value, what, what morale is important to us. And if, if that's taken away from people, I think that's a threat to the democracy of the whole world. Mikhailo Sistak will be waiting to hear back from people in Ukraine to see what more they need and work to get that to them. Right now, he says, they're making plans to provide a local home away from home for Ukrainian refugees that come to the United States. It looks like right now, uh, there's many Ukrainians that are coming to the United States and helping those families settle in and have housing, have food, and have ability to send their children to school and survive here is going to be very important. So a lot of our local community is going to be focused on helping these families that transition to Fresno, that move to Fresno, and help them, whether it's temporarily, once, and if they want to go back to Ukraine to do their business again and live in Ukraine, we're going to help them go back. If they want to settle in here and it's allowed by U.S. government, we want to help them in that regard, too. The Valley's Ukrainians are bracing themselves for a long conflict with more death, destruction, and crimes against humanity yet to come at the hands of Russian troops. But they say, like so many around the world, that their families and friends back home are fighting not just for freedom in Ukraine, but for freedom everywhere. Vic Bedoyan reporting for KPFA News and KFCF Radio. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky will address the United Nations Security Council for the first time at a meeting tomorrow that is certain to focus on what appears to be the deliberate killings in the town of Bucha on the outskirts of the capital, Kiev. The United Kingdom holds the Security Council presidency this month and announced late today that the Ukrainian leader will speak at tomorrow's open meeting. The nomination of Katanji Brown-Jackson to the United States Supreme Court is moving to the full Senate, with a final vote expected Thursday or Friday. Today, the Senate Judiciary Committee held its final vote, ending in a party-line tie of 11 to 11. That expected vote meant Senate leadership could move the nomination forward with the expected confirmation of the high court's first African-American woman, likely by the end of the week. Christopher Martinez filed this report. Chair Durbin, the votes are 11 yeas, 11 nays. It's a tie vote. The committee has recorded a tie vote on Judge Jackson's nomination to be the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. With that tie vote, the nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court can now move forward to a full confirmation vote on the Senate floor. A tie in committee lets the Senate leader send the confirmation to the full Senate, something that has already happened. 
The final day of Judiciary Committee action included more debate over Brown's record and more attacks from Republican senators. John Cornyn is a Republican from Texas. It's crucial that we use these proceedings to understand if a judge will truly stay in their lane or whether they will attempt to legislate from the bench and deliver what Justice Biden and his Democratic colleagues are unable to achieve through the legislative process. A judge must call balls and strikes. And given what I've seen and her unwillingness to disclose her judicial philosophy and a disavow and expansionist view of unenumerated rights, I have concerns that Judge Jackson will be pinch hitting for one team or the other. Ted Cruz is Texas' other Republican senator. There have been 115 men and women who have served on the Supreme Court. If Judge Jackson is confirmed, I believe she will prove to be the most extreme and the furthest left justice ever to serve on the United States Supreme Court. She will be to the left of Justice Sotomayor. She will be to the left of Justice Kagan. She will be way, way, way to the left of Justice Stephen Breyer. Republicans largely repeated their claims that Jackson is soft on crime. They also criticized her judicial philosophy, or at least her inferred or feared judicial philosophy, since Jackson has refused to align herself with any one judicial philosophy like originalism or textualism. Many Republicans complained about how previous Republican high court nominees were treated in past confirmation hearings, such as Brett Kavanaugh four years ago, or failed conservative nominee Robert Bork more than three decades ago. Democrat Cory Booker of New Jersey referred to the parody holiday Festivus, made popular by the television sitcom Seinfeld. I often think maybe we should be holding this hearing during December because, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you know about the vaunted holiday of Festivus, um, uh, which is the holiday for the rest of us during the holidays. And one of the aspects of Festivus is the airing of grievances. And I think that we've had probably the best Festivus celebration here uh, in this hearing over the last week or so because there's been a lot of airing of grievances. Booker blasted Republican questioning that he described as disrespectful. I, I, I've heard language, I won't read through all the attacks on her that I've heard in this hearing today, not to mention the previous days. I, I, I'm sorry, who, who does the American public want to believe? A bunch of elected senators or the independent folks are out there. To say she's a, a, an extremist on crime belies the fact that she has law enforcement group after law enforcement group supporting her. Democrats focused on Jackson's qualifications, the diversity she would bring to the court as its first African-American woman and first former public defender, the historic nature of the nomination, and the example it sets for young people. Democrat Amy Klobuchar described a letter a young constituent sent to President Joe Biden. She had written the President of the United States, 11 years old, and she asked President Biden that she be considered uh, when he was looking for justices. Uh, she pointed out that with her age, she could remain on the court for at least 80 years. Um, her argument was uh, that she wanted to be the voice for children. Um, and she said, I live a few blocks away from the Supreme Court, so it will be easy for me to get there. Of course, Biden picked Jackson, not the 11-year-old. Uh, after the president made his nomination of Judge Jackson, uh, she said, if I'm going to be snubbed, it couldn't be for a better candidate. The nomination now goes to the full Senate for a procedural vote called cloture, with a final confirmation vote on the Senate floor Thursday or Friday. Three Republicans, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Susan Collins of Maine, and Mitt Romney of Utah, have already said they will join Democrats to confirm Jackson. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online, kpfa.org. This is an hour-long news canceled without interruption, airing each night at 6 o'clock, and we've got a half-hour edition at the same time on the weekends. All the newscasts are archived online, kpfa.org, and they're available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. Temperatures on Earth will shoot past a key danger point unless greenhouse gas emissions fall faster than countries have committed. That's what the world's top body of climate scientists warned today, but also noting hopeful signs of progress. 
Reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are considered the most authoritative assessments of the state of global warming, its impacts, and the measures being taken to tackle it. Negotiations to finalize the summary of policymakers dragged on past the original deadline until late last night, pushing back the planned publication by several hours today. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the report by the Intergovernmental Panel revealed a litany of broken climate promises by governments and corporations, accusing them of stoking global warming by clinging to harmful fossil fuels. Guterres said it's a file of shame, cataloging the empty pledges that puts us firmly on track toward an unlivable world. Reporter William Denislow has more. Reacting to this new report, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the world is on a fast track to a climate disaster. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report warns that targets to limit global warming will be impossible to reach unless the world pivots away from fossil fuels much quicker than it currently is. The report signed off by 195 nations and says that countries must collectively cut emissions by 43% by 2030 to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. William Danslow, New York. The state of Colorado is already seeing the impacts of climate change, rising temperatures, more frequent and severe wildfires, flooding and prolonged drought. And economists are trying to help communities identify and mitigate the risks. Eric Gladys has that story. Pagaj Jalali with the Colorado Fiscal Institute says their new website allows Coloradans to see, for example, how air pollution from highways, power plants and refineries and wildfires is impacting their neighborhoods. These are all impacting the health of our communities and also they're impacting our economy because our economy in Colorado is heavily dependent on our environment because of our outdoor recreation industry and our agriculture. Jalali says ColoradoClimateChange.com was created in part to help Colorado residents see how climate change is projected to play out by 2050 and what can be done to avoid the most catastrophic scenarios. An interactive map shows a range of hazards projected by scientists if steps are taken quickly to stop burning fossil fuels or if business continues as usual. Climate change is expected to exacerbate existing barriers and inequalities, and Jalali says some Coloradans are more vulnerable than others. She points to the recent Marshall Fire that destroyed more than 1,000 front range homes and businesses. If you don't have a car, you're less likely to be able to get out of the area. If you don't speak English, you might not be able to get the same information to prepare yourself to evacuate. The site also offers a roadmap for avoiding worst case scenarios. Jalali says investments are needed in neighborhoods that will be disproportionately affected by a warming planet and fossil fuel dependent communities need help finding jobs that pay a living wage. We need to transition to clean energy as quickly as possible and stop burning fossil fuels. We need to hold polluters accountable. We need to tax pollution. We need to prepare our communities to build resiliency. This is Eric Galatis reporting for the Colorado News Connection. Authorities said today that three California Highway Patrol officers who fatally shot a 23-year-old unarmed man in 2020 after he rammed a stolen car into their vehicles in Oakland will not face criminal charges. Alameda County District Attorney Nancy O'Malley publicly released the final report on the June 2020 fatal shooting of Eric Salgado and said she agreed with its conclusion that the evidence does not support criminal charges against the officers. The CHP said at the time the officers were conducting a traffic stop on the Dodge sedan driven by Salgado when he rammed it against their patrol cars and they opened fire. Salgado was struck at least a dozen times. His pregnant girlfriend was in the passenger seat and was wounded. Oakland police said the sedan Salgado was driving was one of 74 vehicles stolen from a San Leandro dealership amid protests over the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. John Burris, one of the attorneys representing the Salgado family in a federal civil rights case against the officers, said he was disappointed but not surprised.
<laughs> Sacramento police arrested a man today connected to the shooting that killed six people and wounded a dozen others in the heart of California's capital as at least two shooters fired more than a hundred rapid fire rounds and people ran for their lives. Police said they booked Dondre Martin, 26 years old, as a related suspect on charges of assault with a deadly weapon and being a convict carrying a loaded gun. Detectives and SWAT team members found one handgun during searches of three homes in the area. The arrest came as the six victims killed were identified in the shooting that occurred Sunday at about 2 a.m. as bars were closing and patrons filled the street near the state capitol. The burst of gunshots sent people running in terror in the neighborhood, which is just a few blocks from Golden One Arena, when the National Basketball Association Sacramento Kings held a moment of silence for the victims before their game on Sunday night. Police Chief Kathy Lester said detectives were trying to determine if a stolen handgun found at the crime scene was connected to the shooting. Witnesses answered her plea for help by providing more than 100 videos and photos of evidence from the shooting scene. We are asking for the public's help in helping us to identify uh, the suspects in this and provide any information that you can to help us solve this. More from reporter Rachel Silverman. It's reportedly the worst mass shooting in the U.S. so far this year. Violence, the Sacramento police chief called unprecedented for the city. Videos posted online appear to show a brawl breakout in the area near the Capitol building in the early hours on Sunday, just before gunfire sent people running. Police have identified the victims, but not the motive for the mass shooting. Rachel Silverman, San Francisco. Authorities say two men were killed and two others were wounded in a weekend shooting at a San Francisco park. A police statement says officers responding to a shooting report Sunday afternoon found four men wounded at the Alice Chalmers playground. Officers rendered aid and summoned medics who took the victims to a hospital where two were pronounced dead. No immediate arrests in the case. Indiana's new law allowing people to carry a handgun without a permit is raising concerns from that state's gun safety advocates. Jonah Chester reports. Under the law signed by Governor Eric Holcomb last month, it'll still be illegal for folks who are barred from carrying a handgun before the measure passed to do so come July when the law takes effect. But Gerald King with the Indianapolis-based group Hoosiers Concerned About Gun Violence says without the permitting process, that's a safeguard without any enforcement mechanism. It seems to us that large numbers of people who would not have passed background checks will now go to gun shops and buy guns. Several law enforcement agencies have also raised concerns the measure would streamline the process to acquire a gun, potentially flooding the state with deadly weapons. With the passage of Indiana's law, nearly half of all U.S. states now allow permitless carry in some form. King points out that a previous version of the bill contained compromises to make it more agreeable to critics. But he says the compromise version approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee was referred to the Senate Rules Committee, where it stagnated and died. The Indy Star reports the bill's original language was then inserted into a separate bill on the final day of the legislative session and passed. Not only was it horrible policy, but it came about through connivance and disingenuous arguments. So it was a pretty bad experience all around. Jen Hahn with the Indiana chapter of Moms Demand Action says the new measure will have serious consequences for Indiana's kids and teens. According to a January report from the gun control advocacy group Every Town for Gun Safety, an average of 110 Hoosier children and teens die each year from gun violence, and one-third of those deaths are suicides. We are in a gun violence crisis here in the state of Indiana. Uh, the leading cause of death for children and teens in Indiana is gun violence. And the majority of those are gun homicides. The report says overall gun deaths in Indiana hit a 10-year high in 2020. The gun death rate during that period also increased by nearly 80% in Indiana, compared to 33% nationally. Han says Moms Demand Action offers online gun safety resources through its Be Smart for Kids initiative. She adds, for Indianapolis residents, the Marion County Sheriff's Office offers free gun locks. For the Indiana News Service, I'm Jonah Chester. This is the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. 
is Brian Edwards Tickert from Upfront, inviting you to start your week with a dose of science. Every Monday after 7.30 news headlines, we're joined by Dr. John Swartzberg, infectious disease specialist at UC Berkeley, to go over the latest research on COVID, what it means for us individually and as a society. Most importantly, to answer your questions. It's COVID Collins with Dr. Swartzberg every Monday at 7.33 on Upfront. Senate bargainers reached agreement today on a slimmed-down $10 billion package for countering COVID-19 with treatments, vaccines, and other steps. The top Democratic and Republican negotiators said, but the measure dropped all funding to help nations abroad combat the pandemic. The compromise drew quick support from President Biden, who initially pushed for a $22.5 billion package. In a setback, he ended up settling for much less amid administration warnings that the government was running out of money to keep pace with the disease's continued, although diminished, spread in the U.S. Biden and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, his party's lead bargainer, also ended up agreeing to abandon Biden's request to include $5 billion to help countries, especially poorer ones, where the disease is still running rampant. Schumer and members of both parties want to craft a second spending measure this spring that could include funds to battle COVID-19 and hunger overseas and more assistance for Ukraine as it continues battling the Russian invasion. However, the fate of such a measure is uncertain. Last week, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention made another booster dose available to adults age 50 and over, as well as those age 12 and up who have weakened immune systems. The key word there is available. They did not say the booster, what would be most people's second booster or fourth shot of a COVID-19 vaccine was necessarily recommended. Dr. John Schwartzberg, Emeritus Professor of Infectious Diseases at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, told KPFA's Brian Edwards Teeker today that the FDA and the CDC are approving another booster for those more at risk of infection for a number of reasons. One is the recognition that the vaccines that we received that is being up to date with vaccination, having had the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and then a booster, that after that booster, that somewhere around four to five months, we see a waning of immunity, still good protection against hospitalization and death, but not as good as we'd like against um, breakthrough infections. And so that waning immunity has been disturbing, and that raised the question, would a fourth jab help? Really, the way I look at it is that the mRNA vaccines are a three-dose vaccine, so you're really up to date with three doses, and this would really be the fourth booster, or excuse me, the fourth, the first booster on that regimen. So... With waning immunity, would a fourth dose help? And the answer appears to be yes. We've got data from Israel that's quite robust in large numbers showing protection against breakthrough infections and further protection against hospitalization and death in people who had that fourth jab. We also have data here from the United States that is not as robust as we'd like to see, that is we'd like to have larger numbers, but the numbers we have also are consistent with what we've seen in Israel. We've had some data from around the world with a few other with a few other reports, but they haven't been quite as um, influential. So bottom line, we do see that if you get that fourth jab, that first booster, that it really does help protect against breakthrough infections, hospitalization, and death. The other big news with um, this this booster dose is for people who had J&J. People who had J&J were advised to get a second dose, either with J&J or with an mRNA vaccine, Pfizer or booster. We've seen with J&J that they get good protection against hospitalization and death, but like with the mRNA vaccines, that immunity does wane. 
And based upon that, the CDC came out with the recommendation to give a booster dose to the people who have had two doses of either J&J or one dose of J&J plus a Pfizer or Moderna dose, then get a third dose. So if it's J&J, it's three doses now to really give you good protection. If it's the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna, it's four doses. So do we know yet whether the benefits of that third or fourth dose would last longer, whether the added protection would last longer than the the four to five months uh, that we got from the third injection before the benefits started to wane? We don't know. Um, We don't have enough data yet to answer that question. Essentially, Brian, what the what the CDC has done is that they've, uh, along with the FDA, have made these vaccines available for people 50 or over, but they didn't recommend them. They made them available, and that's an important distinction. One of the reasons they didn't recommend them is because of the question you just asked, and that is how long will we get protection? As I mentioned before, we know that with the after three jabs, I'm just going to talk about Pfizer and Moderna after three jabs, that the protection wanes at four or five months, uh, clearly at six months. Will we see the same thing with this booster dose, this fourth jab? And the answer is a question mark at this point. Um, we, we need We need to wait and see. My guess is that the immunity is probably not going to last much longer than what we've seen after the third dose. So this extra dose may take us through um, the rest of the spring and the summer. Dr. John Schwartzberg of the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Medicare says that millions of enrollees will finally have access to free over-the-counter COVID-19 tests at drugstores. Today's announcement comes amid worries that the latest coronavirus variant, BA.2, will spark another rise in U.S. cases. More than 59 million people with Medicare's Part B outpatient coverage will be able to get up to eight free at-home tests a month or enough for an individual to test twice a week, as some doctors recommend. Medicare lagged behind private insurance and following the Biden administration's directive to cover at-home tests because program rules and regulations got in the way and officials had to find a workaround. A federal judge in Ohio is blocking the military from disciplining a dozen U.S. Air Force officers who are asking for religious exemptions to the mandatory COVID-19 vaccine. The officers are mostly from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. They, along with a handful of airmen and airwomen and reservists, filed a lawsuit in February after their exemption requests were turned down. A U.S. District Court judge in Cincinnati granted a preliminary injunction last week that will stay in place until the lawsuit is resolved. Also last week, a federal judge in Texas barred the Navy from taking action against sailors objecting to being vaccinated on religious grounds. New data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows the extent of a growing mental health crisis among youth during the COVID-19 pandemic. The CDC study, called the Adolescent Behavior and Experiences Survey, is the department's first nationwide survey of high school students during the pandemic. According to the report, in 2021, more than a third of high school students reported poor mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some students, primarily students of color and LGBTQ students, also reported an increased level of threats to their well-being. Dr. Jonathan Merman is the director of the National Center for HIV, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB prevention, he calls the survey's findings deeply troubling. For over two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged our nation, not just with the tragedy of losing over a million lives, but also the day-to-day pandemic-related disruptions that have been life-altering and often isolating for youth. Although the nation has adapted, this has been a hard experience, especially so for our youth. And our youth have had to adjust 
to different social, educational, and family circumstances while they are growing up. And these experiences, both good and bad, have affected their physical and mental well-being. Youth with poor mental health are more likely to struggle with school decision-making and their physical health. They're also more vulnerable to behavioral risks like drug abuse and violence. Dr. Merriman says high school students were experiencing historically significant mental health challenges even before COVID-19. In the decade prior to the pandemic, more students reported feeling sad and hopeless, and more students attempted suicide. The new data found that alongside increased rates of stress and anxiety, 44% of students report persistently feeling sad or hopeless and unable to engage in their regular activities during the past year. Kathleen Effier, the director of the Division of Adolescent and School Health, says the pandemic has also contributed to more threats facing youth at home. Our data make it clear that young people experience significant disruption and adversity during the pandemic and are experiencing a mental health crisis. Our data exposes cracks and uncovers an important layer of insight into the extreme disruptions that some youth have encountered during the pandemic. For example, youth in the survey reported that in their homes, 55% experienced emotional abuse, 11% had experienced physical abuse, 29% reported that a parent or other adult in their homes lost a job, and 24% said they went hungry because there was not enough food. Ethier says although COVID-19 has affected all youth in some way, it has not affected all youth equally. The new data shows lesbian, gay, bisexual, and female youth report greater levels of poor mental health, more emotional abuse by a parent or a caregiver, greater rates of attempted suicide than their counterparts. Survey also asked students whether they experienced racism at school. Over a third of students said they did, 64% of Asian students, 55% of black and multiracial students said they experienced racism before or during the pandemic. Racism among youth has been linked to poor mental health, academic performance, and lifelong health risk behavior. The data also finds LDGBTQ youth and youth who experience racism feel less connected at school. However, if you said the data speaks to the power of schools in mitigating the impacts of the pandemic. CDC's What Works in Schools program incorporates specific strategies that schools can use to help all students feel safer and more supported. Improving the health and well-being of LGBTQ students is an essential component of that work. School policies and practices designed to support LGBTQ youth lead to improvements in mental health and suicide-related behaviors. When schools are less toxic for youth and increased risk for severe outcomes, schools are less toxic for everyone. Ethier also recommends opportunities for students to engage in their communities and be mentored by supportive adults to help combat a mental health crisis. Teachers and other workers returned to schools in Sacramento following weekend negotiations that resolved a strike over better pay and more staffing that lasted nearly two weeks. The Sacramento City Unified School District announced yesterday that it reached tentative agreements with the Sacramento City Teachers Association and a union representing bus drivers. The strike at one of the districts in California's capital began on March 23rd, affecting 43,000 students and 76 schools. The Teachers Association tweeted that the deal will help address a severe staffing crisis. Sunny skies are predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the mid-60s around the San Francisco Bay. Further inland, highs should be in the mid-70s. Sunny skies in the central San Joaquin Valley as well with a high of 80 degrees predicted. And in Los Angeles, sunny with a high in the mid-70s. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, April 4th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening.
Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24ABR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.